Making a movie is easier than ever. Filmmaking has become the new garage band. Hi, I'm Dino Tripodis. This is Framelines, the show that highlights people making films in Ohio right now. Framelines is brought to you in part by Sabo Studios, gear for the show. Tape Central, providing your media needs. Production Partners Media, affordable media solutions. And by grants from the Greater Columbus Arts Council and the Ohio Arts Council. This week's feature filmmaker is Gabrielle Burden of Five Sisters Productions. That was a lot of moolah, and nobody came after it. <laughs> well, if they showed up now, they'd be many years late and $3,300 short. You know, double that. Every cent I got is tied up in Ace High, best dealer school in Winnemucca. Nobody has their 3300 I could take out another loan on my shop. You can barely make your payments now. Daddy gives haircuts to half the city of Buffalo for free. Yeah, we have it. Even if we wanted to give the money back, which nobody in their right mind would, you're over 13000 short. Actually, I it's over 16000 well, What happened to your share? I put it in the poor box. When I went back to get it, not five minutes later, that box was empty. I'm telling you, Father Daly had a censor rigged up to that rectory. I was standing in the middle of the church yelling, we're the poor! My four sisters and I have a film company, Five Sisters Productions, and we all came together because we realized we had these different talents and interests, and if we pulled them together, it would be fun to work on a project, and that started Five Sisters Productions. We are very collaborative, and so it's a company that we've structured as kind of an umbrella, so we don't want anyone who's the boss in charge. Just Friends was the first feature film we did, and that was a romantic comedy. It was sort of your fun, sweet, low-budget romantic comedy. Just Friends was shot on a complete shoestring with total support from free film from Kodak, free cameras from Panavision. Everything was done for us, and it still cost 50 grand. And that was my sister's savings. She spent it, you know, to do it. AMC Channel then used Just Friends to launch the Wii Channel. Now, obviously, people can buy a camcorder and have a lot more creative opportunity to do things that are within their reach. Where it is complicated is the distribution aspect. Windows have closed for people. Yes, there's YouTube and all these things, but how can you make a living as a filmmaker? And that has gotten more difficult. Temps was our second movie, which was a slice of life film about 20-somethings. Um, it was sort of an answer to slackers and clerks about people who actually did work and really cared about their work and cared about doing something to make a, a contribution to the world. There is something interesting, it seems, in our generation where you were told you could do anything and then when you get into life, you can't really be everything. And that's what that movie explores. It's not what I thought. Profit is all that matters to these people. <laughs> well, the world runs on money. That's what everyone's working for. Maybe that's what you work for which is why you keep jumping from job to job, but I work for what I believe in. I'm just not up for your cynicism today. Wait a minute, something just happened. Oh, don't do this. I don't jump from job to job because of money. Wait, I want to get this. You guys seem to think the world owes you. That somehow you deserve happiness. Temps led to Manna from Heaven, which is a, a comedy about people who find a lot of money and many years later one of them says they have to raise the money and give it back. We thought, how could you make a film that within five minutes you knew was going to end well, but wasn't a saccharine film that also was unrealistic. I mean, in this film there are con artists who are still con artists at the end. That movie MGM picked up and that was really an extraordinary experience. I directed Manna from Heaven with my sister Maria and we worked with amazing actors. They're wonderful character actors we've loved for a long time. Working with those actors was really incredible because they were Academy Award winners and people that you know were real veterans in the, in the field. We were appealing to something in these actors that was an opportunity for them that they hadn't had before. And for us, it was really fun to bring that amount of talent into a room and have them working all the time together, which was pretty complicated for eight people's schedules to get them for four weeks in Buffalo, New York in the winter. So we ended up releasing that independently, and then MGM came in when it proved that it was working. The happiest day of his life, it's a, about a traditional wedding in a gender-reversed world. So the guy wears a top hat and veil and walks down the aisle. 
He's just glowing. He's gorgeous now. He'll start aging and she'll trade him in for someone younger. This must have cost Miss Somerset a fortune. Poor boys. Poor thing. She must have kept trying. You have a Kleenex, honey? Who gives this man to this woman? I do. It's a really fun short film that makes people think about weddings and American traditions and also about our gender roles in society in a new way, but through humor. Projects come from each of us and depending on the project, that person will helm. I'm helming the documentary that we're doing set here in Columbus, which I'm excited about. Yay, finally, um, getting Columbus in the picture for us. I didn't know that much about the filmmaking community. And as that's developed, and obviously I've gotten to know more people here, it's a really nice, solid group of people who I think are interested in doing creative projects that have a genuine nature to them. I think people really care about what they're working on, and they're unstoppable. People don't let big budget needs stop them. They'll figure out ways to do creative things through their own means. And I really like that about Columbus. If you do it as an artist because there's something you want to say in this project, there's something you want to do, and even if it's only you and your parents or your partner or your friend watching it and it moves that one person, that's what you did it for. Frame Lines puts the spotlight on the Colony Festival in Marietta, Ohio. I'm Hunt Brawley, the development director at the Colony Theater, uh, which is you know, mainly charged with the restoring theater that was built in 1919. But we uh, started the film festival really as a way to both create uh, an event in, in Marietta, Ohio, which we always thought would just be you know, a nice small town uh, for a film festival. Uh, and a way to create a little bit of a you know, film presence in this region. It was always hard for people that were interested in film to really engage in that activity here. Several filmmakers you know, grew up here, had to leave, you know, had to go to New York, had to go to Los Angeles, had to leave town uh, to really pursue this. Originally, Andrew Jones, who uh, was really interested in restoring the Colony Theater, uh, it was his idea to put this uh, festival together, and he'd always had an interest in the, the Colony Theater approached us about doing that. We said, well, sure, you know, we'd love to do that. I've been the film festival coordinator for about five years. This is the fifth year. And actually with uh, Troy Duvall and Andrew Jones, I was one of the founders that started the festival the very first year. It's the sixth year that we've been doing this. Each year we, we you know, meet new people, bring new people in, uh, you know, Columbus, Charleston. It, it's really great kind of developing those ties regionally. Uh, and, and you can already feel a little bit of a you know, film community presence building. Hey, oh, that was your film. Oh, cool. Hey, how did you do that? You know, by the way, you know, can I get your contact? And uh, that's really what I think is good about this festival. And at each year, building and building towards something like a, you know, a networking type of festival. This festival just brings filmmakers together. Uh, and really serves as kind of a gathering point and a forum to network. Film technology and the price for cameras and um, you know projection equipment, you know, has dropped, allowing a lot of emerging filmmakers to kind of come in and do something, uh, you know, really create a quality product for a lot less money. And I think that makes it easier in a in a small uh, community like this. I'm always amazed watching the films at you know what kind of quality you can get with relatively low budgets and, and I think you know part of the point of this whole festival is that you know we are trying to provide form for emerging filmmakers. People you know just love uh, you know what's going on on that screen and you know I hope it serves a you know a bit of an encouragement for you know young filmmakers that hey you know I don't need to invest a million dollars in this film you know to get something out there. A couple of really nice local uh, stories are um, Josh Crooks uh, went to uh, Marietta College and is going on to make some pretty nice films. And then Will Wedig went to Marietta High School and uh, is going on to do some, some pretty nice film work in New York and L.A. And so, uh, you know, every once in a while we get a film like that and uh, when, when the Crook brothers um, showed their film Salvage, we actually showed it in the, the Colony Theater when it was pretty much, you know, kind of dark and, you know, unrestored. 
Uh, we had almost 400 people for that because, you know, there's such a, a local connection. And then we had a really nice uh, Pam Tanner Bowl, who's an Academy Award uh, winning filmmaker out of Parkersburg, right across the river, um, did the, uh, the film series Born in the Brothels that was aired on PBS. And she had a really fantastic film, um, uh, Who Does She Think She Is? Um, you know, about women, uh, women in the arts, you know, kind of struggling between, you know, artistic presentation and, and just, you know, family and, and uh, personal matters. And so, you know, I well have a really nice kind of filmmaker that, that comes in and... They all put together great filmmakers from New York. They went to Marietta College and again, another place where I started to network with filmmakers was right there, actually inside of the theater. It was cold, I remember. It was October. We were all bundled up, had toboggans on. And I remember going and talking to him and said, oh man, that film was great, you know. Um, I gotta, you know, I gotta work with you. I gotta, you know, get my hands in with you. And I actually worked with him on one of his feature films. Uh, what I've really learned to appreciate is, is this festival just brings filmmakers together uh, and really serves as kind of a gathering point and, and an abil you know, a forum to network. It's, it's still storytelling, it's still you know, uh, arts presentation and, you know, just a good story well done and, and you get some amazing things here. Coming up next, Peter John Ross demonstrates some movie making techniques. For this video, we're going to look at the effects of fast and slow cutting. They say rules are made to be broken, but sometimes rules are made because they work. Editing is a powerful aspect to movie making. How quickly you cut from one shot to another can have a profound effect on the viewer. How exciting would a car chase be if you only had one shot to work with? Not too thrilling. Let's try cutting from more than one camera angle. Now, more is not always better. For this, we're going to have a nice romantic scene. The faster cutting won't work as well. Now, let's try that again, only this time we're going to use fewer edits. Like all other aspects of making a movie, the pacing of the editing can be used to tell the story more effectively. Framelines talks to Justin Russell about his new movie, The Sleeper, shot in Central Ohio. These girls. Hello? Hello? Who is this? Fanny's first. <laughs> Bobby, is that you? <laughs> Bobby, you've got to stop prank calling this line. Do you hear me? Cindy's first. <gasps> Bobby! <laughs> Cindy! Bobby called again and is being lewd. Can you please tell him to stop calling? I have. I'll tell him again.
Uh, I got started with filmmaking uh, when I was really young, probably about 12 or 13. I started making movies with my dad's old video camera. Uh, just a high 8 camera that I would take out and make little zombie films, little G.I. Joe movies and stuff like that. Uh, the sleeper originated uh, more or less in the middle of the night. I woke up in my bedroom and my door was open and I was like, man, I could have swore that I had shut that door. And then I got thinking just late at night, you know, you start uh, just spiraling ideas. And I thought that would be really creepy if somebody came in to your, to your room while you were sleeping at night and then just kind of killed you. I was like, that's not really been done before. It's like a killing somebody in your sleep kind of idea especially for a slasher movie, and I thought, wow, that'd be a really awesome lost 80s slasher movie. I grew up with like 80s horror films, more or less, um, after I was a little bit young for when they first came out, but the kind of got into them after the fact. It's not really that I was into the horror element, I was into more of the atmosphere and the ambience of, that, of the genre at that time. More or less, the 80s films had something different that horror films don't have today. Just a style that I think has been lost in filmmaking. That's why I kind of want to bring that 80s style back. Current horror is cheaper almost. What they decide to do with the audience is they take it a different way. The 80s horror films were sort of uh, campy and, and fun, but at the same time there was elements of horror that would scare people. But the new style of horror is more of like... Uh, cheap scares, uh, quick little things that they'll throw in there, sound bites, because sound has become such a long way from the 80s that sound is uh, sound design is a huge play on horror films nowadays. So some of the beauty of the 80s horror films was they were so cheaply made, and it was just a group of people that would go out and make, make this little movie and, and just try their best. Uh, the great example would be Nightmare on Elm Street. And they just went out and they just believed in this idea, and they made it probably one of the most creepy films of that era, I would say. I shot The Sleeper in Springfield, Ohio and we shot it in February of earlier this year. Principal photography was about uh, 13 days. For this film, uh, as most of my films are, I always write the film and then I produce, direct, shoot, edit, and score the films. The size of the crew was uh, relatively small. Um, we didn't have a lot of money, obviously. It was a very low budget shoot. We pretty much had, I think, about 10 people total. Cole Pisano was my gaffer and key grip and was an enormous help during the shoot. Um, Dana Jackson, uh, who is relatively new to the industry, she just works solely with me. She worked as my acting producer and assistant director, which helped out. Aaron Russell, my brother, was the executive producer of the show. So he just made sure everything was going smooth and helped fund the film. And then the rest, of, the rest of the crew is pretty much made up of friends from Bowling Green and friends from home that helped put it together. They've been with me since the beginning. We shot on uh, the Panasonic AF100, and what attracted me to the camera was um, the fact that we could, you know, use prime lenses. I had just worked on a film in December that was shooting in Columbus, and we were outside the entire time. Uh, so it was an absolute freezing experience. Uh, so I was somewhat weathered to, to brave the cold of my film in February. A little bit less cold than December, but uh, we shot, I would say, about 20% of the movie outside. And it was cold, but we didn't stay out too long, so we were able to weather it pretty well. And the heat in the sorority house was spotty at best, but... <laughs> the biggest challenge, especially in Ohio, I think, making films is just to get every, every location and everything on board to understand kind of what you're doing. Basically, organizing a film in Ohio is kind of difficult just because it's not Los Angeles. Not everyone knows what goes into making a movie. So we would roll into a location, and even though we'd had a conversation of what they should expect, they still, you know, they get really, oh my gosh, I didn't know you had this much gear, I didn't know you were bringing in this kind of people, and we said, well, we kind of told you that. That's, that's sort of the hardest issue, I think, is dealing with the, the awareness of filmmaking in Ohio, that it actually does exist. Convincing people that, yes, you can make a higher quality film in such a small area like Columbus or Springfield. Films are being shot here all the time. One of the other bigger obstacles was finding uh, the cast. We had an enormous cast of 20 plus people. Finding talent, especially all locally, was difficult. The film is based around a sorority house, and so there was six, seven girls that needed to be cast for these parts, and they're relatively large roles. Filmmaking in Ohio is, it's got its pluses and minuses for sure. I think as far as being able to do things uh, on a low budget scale, you couldn't really do that in many other places like you can in Ohio. If you basically were working in a larger city or in a larger market, things like locations and crew and talent, everything would be just you know, astronomical. But working in a smaller area like Columbus is always nice. You can find crew that's very eager to get started and work and they're very talented. You can find talent that's also really talented that is just looking to get out there and 
and basically be in a film, be in a project. And so that's always a plus that you can find. And I think Ohio has a lot of that to offer. Cleveland is striving more now with their film commission. They're, try they're striving more to bring in bigger films and, and help filmmakers out. Columbus feels like it's kind of, it doesn't really have that safety net or that, that help that Cleveland might have now. So it would be nice to have a really strong centralized film commission that worked with the independent film market and with independent filmmakers to help their projects get off the ground. After the screening of The Sleeper, I was, it was an extremely positive experience. I think it went over very well. I could be a little bit more happy with the film, but of course on a low budget you try to do the best you can and obviously things fall through the cracks and I could see it on the screen. And I, I think after the screening I went and re-edited about four minutes out of it and made it a little bit stronger. But overall after the screening I, I could see that it was definitely a film that worked. I was really pleased with the screening. Coming up in early September, I'm gonna be shooting a first part of an anthology film that I'm working on with a new producer. Uh, we're gonna shoot a four part horror anthology film and it will basically be taking place over the course of the next six months. My first film is coming out on DVD on August 16th. It's called Death Stop Holocaust and it is found on Amazon and Walmart and hopefully soon to be on Netflix. My advice as an independent filmmaker is always just to make something. I hear a lot of filmmakers that talk about wanting to do a project and, oh, if I only had the money to do this project and that. Um, with technology the way it is now, uh, it's available to you relatively cheap. There's always a friend that has a camera or a friend that has an editing system. And I, My best advice is to, to go out and just do it, just make a project. Because you'll sit around and you'll talk about it for years and years to come, and if you don't go out and do it, you'll, you'll never learn from anything and you'll never be able to work towards anything else. Peter John Ross and the panel give advice to beginning filmmakers. Okay, so this round table is really to discuss things, advice for first time filmmakers. I think the biggest mistake I made right off the bat is uh, I cast friends and family instead of <laughs> actors. And uh, yeah, it's like a classic failure moment, you know? I thought, well, it's a pretty good story and maybe they won't make people's eyes roll out of their head. <laughs> unless they're actors. <laughs> That's right, yeah, unless they're, <laughs> yeah, unless yeah. they're actors. I know some actors hard to work with their friends and family though. Right? I think, experience. It's, I think it's also don't try to, I like to keep things very organic and, uh, you know, know, know your limitations. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I just feel like a lot of times people try to bite off more than they can chew and then, then you just get yourself in trouble. But what were the things you regret that oh, you man. learned from? Sound. I never, I never realized how important sound was. And not only that, but even having a, a, an experienced DP, you know, you look on the screen and you see all these bad lighting and bad shots and everything. Um, I think I think having a professional sound person is probably the key. If I could ever save money again, it would be on a DP and a sound person. Yeah, I mean, I agree totally. Because if, if you don't, if your sound's not there, you, you really have nothing. And um, I, I think people just don't realize how much it actually takes, you know, that goes into it. There's from, from the script to the actors, lighting, camera, everything, there's just so much stuff that people, they might see a movie and they, they might think, oh, I can do this, but then when you're actually doing it, you can definitely get overwhelmed. Tell me about it. I didn't think I could make a movie. Let me just be clear. <laughs> I, I thought I could, I, I thought, I bet I can write a good story. I mean, I'd written my whole life. Um, and then I thought, well, I'll just be an adventure to see if I can figure out how to get it sensibly onto screen. And, uh, you know, this like, major failures along the way the first time. I think it's an interesting point though. Uh, you learn, I, I, at least I did, that um, you have to strike this balance between being collaborative and did you build a functioning vision at the beginning and get everybody lined up to it and that kind of becomes your, uh, how you make decisions you know, going forward. So you have to be collaborative, you have to hear all the points of view, but it's actually really liberating to be able to say, well, we all agree to this vision and you know, that, that saved, I, I, I found it saves a lot of hurt feelings to say, look, we set out, we knew what we were going to make, and I appreciate that. I love your idea, but, but it doesn't fit, right? right. So I, it's just an interesting, you, you bringing up being, it being collaborative. It is, and yet mostly I think one person owns the vision. Yeah, I think, I think one of the biggest things, um, because after I, I shot my uh, first movie, organization is the key mm. and and working with some people I'm finding that they're not as organized as, as I am being former military and stuff so 
that drives me crazy. So any first time filmmaker got to be organized and, and it's really to me about the five days you're not shooting where you get organized as opposed to just those two days, the weekend when yeah. you're shooting. Right. Because if you're not organized those five days, it shows those two days. <laughs> so I went to film school. So when I was in film school, we were shooting, you know, 60 millimeter and Super 8. And then, you know, when I moved back, it was the digital revolution shooting with XL. And I hated the fact that it just had the video look. Mm -hmm. So I always was, you know, I hated video. I, 24 frames came along that was that made mm -hmm. things nicer and now the fact that you can switch lenses get the depth of field that you want I feel like that's been huge in terms of like progressing my, my what, what, I, what I do you have the want storytelling to tools exactly you, you have the tools to achieve what your vision might have might have been so I want to thank everybody for coming for the panel and everything and uh, I appreciate your time thanks for inviting thanks for having me thanks for I appreciate it if you would like to know more about the films or the filmmakers, you can check us out on the web at www.framelines.tv. That's a wrap, and thanks for watching Framelines.